thought that before we turn to the uh, subject of Pesach, we could try to grapple with um, one of the general questions in this series, and perhaps the most difficult of all religious or religious philosophical questions, and that is the question of predestination, destiny, predestination and free will. Um, I just finished a book about that subject. That's called, uh, it's called Will, Freedom and Destiny. You have to buy at least two copies if you want to understand it um, deeply. And uh, just got sent off this week to the publishers and do it first in e- e-book format, you know, where you, you can download it and then hopefully a few weeks' time we'll be able to print it um, hard, in hard copy. But one of the subjects that I've been thinking about, I had to research in order to uh, write that, is this very difficult subject. The book is about free will, free will issues in general. But one of the most difficult, probably the most difficult, is the question of foreknowledge and free will. So let me try to explain what the problem is, or why it's so difficult, and share with you a few of the angles that the commentaries have taken throughout the ages. It's a difficult subject. I must warn you that at the end of the day, we'll, I hope you'll have a lot more insight into the problem, but I will not promise you an understanding of the answer. In fact, I can almost promise you that you'll not have an answer. So if you're kind of person who gets frustrated at that sort of thing, now's your chance to leave. Um, it's not, you know, it's not destined whether you leave or not. You have the free will to make a decision. So you're welcome to, uh, I wouldn't be offended if you left. But let's at least share the fascination of the subject. And I try also to show why it's important practically, even though it's a very philosophical and difficult subject and doesn't have a formal analytical resolution. Why is it important to grapple with, why is it important to grapple with something that you can't understand? There are a lot of, a lot of questions here. Try to show as much as we can. Obviously, can't deal with it all in one session, but let's try to make a start. <coughs> Is that okay? <laughs> all right, let's try to do this. If there's time for questions, maybe we could we could uh, do that as well. But let me try to paint a picture of um, of this this subject and show some of its uh, fascination. The question is this. The question is that if something is destined, and in Jewish terms we would say foreknown, that means when God knows in advance that something is going to be a certain way, it would seem that you couldn't have free will to make it different. That's the clash, right? It's a classic clash between Yadir and Bechira. Yadir means God's knowledge, and Bechira means human free will. And just to get the question clear, if something is known before, and if, if, if Hashem, God, sees today that tomorrow you will have a right-left choice and you're going to choose right, then there's no way you could choose left tomorrow. Because if you already knew before you got to that fork in the road that you were going to choose right, there really was no option for you to choose left. I mean, is that, is that clear? No, that's a big question. So All right, okay, so let, let's think about it. There are a number of ways you can say the question. One is you can say that your choice is forced. Another way you can phrase the question is you didn't really have an option to do. Left was never really an option. Since God knew you'd be choosing right, left never really was an option at all. There are a number of ways you can state the, the problem, and each of them is significantly different. But just without going into that, those distinctions at the moment, just to get a general feel for the question, and that is that if something is foreknown or predestined, we don't like the word destiny, let's just get that clear, because destiny, I don't think there's really a Jewish word for destiny. Destiny is an English <coughs> concept that's based on Greek, if you want a formal definition or history, you go back to Greek drama, where you have the notion of destiny. Destiny means that a thing will be in the future, and inherent in the definition of destiny is the, is, is the idea that the thing will definitely be. Right? In a Greek tragedy, for example, right, you know, Oedipus is destined to marry his mother and, ki- and, and, and kill his father. Right? There's nothing he can do. And the whole play shows how he tries desperately to get out of that. And all that he does that tries to get him out of it gets him into doing exactly what was destined. Destiny means you cannot escape what will be. We don't believe in that. Okay? We don't believe in destiny. We, we believe in something called Hashem's foreknowledge, God knowing in advance, which, if anything, is more difficult, right? Is more solid than destiny. But destiny meaning a thing will be. <coughs> Just to take one simple example, if everything in the future were destined, then let's say your marriage partner was destined. Right? So people think Bashir. Bashir means there's a marriage partner that's kind of uh, Bashir. So they translate it as destined. If destiny means that it was destined that you marry the person, which means there's nothing you could do to do it or get out of it, then you'd have to make an effort. Walk out into the street, grab the first thing in a skirt. Well, th- these days that doesn't assure you much. But, I mean, assume, 
assume you're male and uh, you, you know, you'd like to marry a female, um, and you tried that, then she would turn out to be the right girl. Because if it's destined that you'll marry somebody, then no matter what you do, you're going to marry the person. So, and we don't believe in that. We believe that we don't have that notion of a destiny fixed in that way. But perhaps even more difficult is the, is the notion of God's knowing in advance. Now, let's not call it destiny or predestination. Let's call it foreknowledge, idea. If Hashem knows beforehand that something will happen tomorrow, there's absolutely no way it could fail to happen tomorrow. So how can you have any free will to make it happen differently? Free will means you can make A or B. You can choose right or left. right? But if you know that behind the scenes, although you're not privy to his knowledge, it's true that you experience free will. No one argues about that, right? Even the most atheistic materialist scientists today admit that we have a sense of free will. They just say it's an illusion. Right? They say it's just an illusion. It's just your brain chemistry making you think that you're free. But they certainly have to grapple with a very difficult problem of the fact that we experience free will. We feel like we're choosing right or left. And the problem is that if you have an experience of choosing right or left, and you know that God knew the day before which it was you were going to choose, then although you'd, you're not privy to his knowledge, you have to admit it would seem that you don't have any free will. So that is the problem. Any, any problems with the problem? Um, there are seats over here. So you can you just disturb everybody by walking across it. <laughs> So that's the difficulty, right? That's the difficulty. And there seem to be only two ways out of this, both of which are extremely uncomfortable, right? Extremely uncomfortable and seem to be against axioms of Torah. One way out of this would be to suggest that you don't have free will, that you don't really have free will. You have an experience of free will, but actually it's not true. That is a very difficult suggestion because, first of all, we experience our free will. Secondly, the Torah gives commandments. and Isn't the world created for free Yes, indeed. Marina, yeah, let's, let's begin with that. That's even better, yeah. You're saying even better than me. Wasn't the world created for free will in the first place? I'll try and explain that. Absolutely. It would make a nonsense of that. Secondly, the Torah would turn out to be lying. Because the Torah tells you that you have free will. It says, choose this or choose that. Thirdly, the Torah gives you mitzvahs. they would be ridiculous to command you to do something and prohibit you from doing something if you couldn't choose otherwise. It would be absolutely ridiculous to say to somebody, do this or don't do that when he's not free to choose. And... Beyond that would be the problem of reward and punishment. How could you possibly punish somebody for doing something that he really had no option right, n- not to do? And also, how could you reward someone if he did something that was inevitable that he was going to do anyway, and, and it, you know, there really never was a choice? Those are some of the difficulties with suggesting that our free will is not, is not real. The alternative is even worse. To say that God doesn't know before and what, you try, what you're going to do in the future is religiously more problematic, right? To say that Hashem doesn't know To say that God doesn't know the future, then that would be even more problematic. God is perfect, right? He's all-knowing, all-powerful. That's absolutely axiomatic. And therefore, to say that he doesn't know the future would seem to be problematic. So this is, these are the horns of our dilemma. How do, we, how, do we handle this? how do we handle this question? So let me take you through a tour of history, right? Let's begin in the post-Talmudic era and see what our great commentaries have said about this and try to fathom what they are saying. I'd like to suggest to you that each of them is very difficult to understand, and in various ways they are saying that you cannot understand this problem. And then we get to the days of the great Arizal, the great Kabbalistic master in the 1500s, he died in 1574. He gives us a way to think about this question. I'm not saying he gives you an answer, but he gives us a way to think about the problem, which has been so useful that all the com- many of the commentaries, maybe most of them since his day, have adopted that way of thinking about the question, right? And I'll try to show what that, what that, what that is. So it's a very fruitful area for philosophical um, analysis. And um, in the secular world, by the way, just to note that, this is an ancient problem in philosophy. The Greeks dealt with this. Whether you talk about foreknowledge of God or whether you talk about a predestiny mm. from some other reason or whether you talk about a, a, a destined mm. a universe that is... Um, uh, determined, deterministic universe, which means that things have to play out the way they play. Whichever, whatever angle you come from that is deterministic, you will have this question. But the question is certainly strongest when you talk about God because that's, you know, is not amenable to mistakes and to imperfect knowledge. So let's begin with the Rambam. The Rambam, who was born in 1135, he died in 1204. The Rambam says 
He is now, without question, the starting point for this discussion. Everyone since the day of the Rambam has started with him and either completely agreed or in some way disagreed or, or, or modified. But there's no question that he's the definitive starting point. And I would say that throughout Jewish history, if you're asked for a definitive position on this question, the Rambam is the definitive, he's been accepted as the, the, way, to, the way to approach this question. And the Rambam phrases the question very clearly. He says that since Hashem knows before and is perfect, he couldn't fail to know perfectly. And therefore, if he knows you're going to do a certain thing tomorrow, since his knowledge couldn't be wrong, you have to do that. And therefore, it would seem that you have free will. The Rambam says this is an extremely difficult question. He says it would take oceans of ink and forests of reeds to write an answer to this question. He says elsewhere, not in his uh, Laws of Chuba, but elsewhere in the Shemone Prokim, which is introduction to the section of the Mishnah, the Rambam says he would rather not have spoken about this at all. Silence would have been better. But evidently he feels the need to talk about it. And he says that the resolution of this question is that you cannot understand the resolution of the question. He says the reason is because you can't know what God's knowledge is. You can experience free will. You can know that you face a right-left decision and you can make a choice. But you can't know what it means to know like God knows. The way he puts it is, he puts it like this. He says that Hashem and His knowledge are one. And just like you cannot understand what God is, therefore you cannot understand His knowledge. God is not a being who has knowledge like we do. A human being is a being and he has knowledge. The knowledge could be there, it could go away. You could have it today and forget it tomorrow. So your knowledge is not you. Your knowledge is an aspect of you. It's part of you. It's a function of your mind. But Hashem is not like that. He doesn't have parts. Hashem will okay, Hashem echad. God is one. And therefore he and his knowledge, he puts it very poetically. He says the knower, the known, and the knowledge are all one. Right? The knower, the one who knows, what he knows, and how he knows, the mechanism of knowledge, all one thing. And so you can't say, there's God who has knowledge. And since he and his knowledge are one thing, by definition you can't understand God, right? Some of the later commentaries say, you know, the Yid- Yiddish expression, like you say, uh, I don't know how you say this, it's like, woe to a God whom you could understand. Who would want a God that you could understand? I mean, you wouldn't want a God that you could understand. If you could understand him, he'd be like in your class, right? Who wants, who wants a God in your class, with all due respect? And therefore... You can't understand him, and so you can't understand his knowledge, and therefore you have to admit with humility that you can experience your free will. What his knowledge means, you cannot understand. Now, many later commentaries have explained this in different ways. Of Desla, for example, explained it like this. The Rambam doesn't say this, but he explains as follows. He says the reason you can't understand Hashem's knowledge is because you cannot understand what it means to know something in advance. You can't know the future before it's happened. It's just logically impossible. You can't know what hasn't happened yet. You can't understand, a human being cannot understand what it means to exist outside of time. He used to give a, a, a picture of this, this helps you, maybe it's useful. He used to say, imagine a map with a route on the map. And imagine that someone is taking that journey. And over the map is a card with a small hole. And as the journey moves, the card moves. And all you see through the small hole on the, on the card is the part of the map that's operating now. That's how you see life. God is looking at the map without the code. He's looking at the, he's looking at past, present, and future. He sees it all in the present, and therefore, and you can't understand that because that makes a nonsense of past, present, and future. And so, because you cannot think of what it means, you can't understand what it means to have seen the future that hasn't happened yet. That's what you cannot understand about this question. That's what he says. The Rambam's telling you, of course, not only that you can't understand it, but that it's an obligation to know that you can't understand God. You can't know Him. <coughs> And you can't know what he knows. <coughs> and there are, many, there are many verses that say this. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. And there are other beautiful um, textual proofs for this. One beautiful textual proof that some commentaries bring. It says, Ki gavhu It's like heaven is higher than earth. My knowledge is higher than yours. It's a very elegant proof or, or textual source. Hashem says, as my knowledge is, as heaven is higher than earth, my knowledge is higher than yours. And the commentaries say, right, <coughs> heaven is not, well, as heaven is higher than earth, earth is not high at all. If earth was somewhat high and heaven was higher, it would mean there's a relative, there's, there's relative heights here. And my knowledge is, is, is higher than yours relatively. But heaven is not higher than earth is high, earth isn't high at all. So when the verse tells you that heaven is higher than earth, what it's telling you is that the two things that have no relationship. Is this clear? Earth isn't high at all. 
So heaven being higher than earth means it's a completely different thing. So my knowledge compared to yours. My knowledge is not higher than your knowledge. My knowledge is categorically different than yours. You cannot approach my knowledge. That is that. And there are, many, there are other sources that are used to show this elegantly in verses and various other fashions. That's the rub. And that, I think, is the starting point. It's, it's, that's, the, I think, the, the, the definitive or, or the, the basic Jewish approach is that you'd have to know what God is. You'd have to be Him, basically. And therefore, you cannot know what it means to know the future. But He does. And the Rambam is very clear that both are true, right? That God knows the future, and you have free will. They're impossibly, impossible to coexist, and they do. The Rambam's source for this, which he says elsewhere, is the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, Hakol Tzafui Varushus Nesuna. Hakol Tzafui, everything is seen in advance, and free will is given. And the Mishnah has an interesting ending, which if there's time, perhaps we can talk about. But this Mishnah is talking, says clearly that all is foreseen, and yet you have free will. I called Safui, everything is seen in advance. The Hebrew word Safui means to see. So there's a scout. A scout goes ahead of the army, and he sees what's ahead, and yet Harushus Nasuna, free will is given. On this Mishnah, the Rambam explains, fascinating, I think we'll have time to go into this in depth now, but I just extract one thing. The Rambam says that this Mishnah is telling you something fascinating. The Mishnah is telling you that both of them are real. In case you try to get out of the problem by saying one of them is not real. And of course the temptation is to say your free will is not real. You have to be a very, uh, a very um, brazen, uh, courageous individual to <coughs> say that God doesn't know the future. Right? That's extreme. To say humans have free will, which is really somewhat illusory, perhaps you could say that. The Rama says the Mishnah is telling you that they're both real. He knows in advance for sure. And you have real free will. <coughs> and that cannot exist together. And yet they do. Right, that's what he says. So, our free was not an illusion. It is real. Which means you have the real choice to change history from the way that he knew that it was going to be. You can really do that. And yet you can't, because he knew in advance. Right? And that, of course, that's what human beings cannot understand. So, that is the source. And many countries talk about that. <coughs> and perhaps at some future time we can go into that Mishnah more deeply. But, let's take a few other angles on this question and see what they say. There's one source before the Rambam, that's Rav Sadyagon, living a couple of hundred, two or three hundred years before the Rambam. And he puts it like this. He is very short and very cryptic. And he says this. He says, Hashem knows in advance, what does He know? What you will choose. But He knows what you will freely choose. Hashem knows in advance what you will choose freely. That's all. Simple. Straightforward. He knows the future. He's given you free will, which means you have real free will. He knows in the future what you will choose freely. That's what he knows. And therefore, by definition, his knowledge doesn't force your choice. Because what he knows isn't what you'll choose. What he knows that you'll ch is that you'll choose it freely. So in the definitions, you have free choice and he knows in advance. Does that help? I don't know. That's what he says. Many others take that line of thinking and they put it in various different ways. But that's what he says, speaking before the Rambam. The Rambam follows him and says, you can't understand it. Let's take some other angles on this and see if we can enrich the, the view here. The most famous criticism of the Rambam is probably the Ravid. The Ravid was contemporary of the generation of the Rambams, and he attacks him in very, very, very strong terms, on occasion attacking him even in words that appear to be personal, right? And he uses words like, you know, by, by, my, by my life, you know, this, this, this author, meaning the Rambam, does not not making sense. I mean, he, he speaks in extremely strong terms against the Rambam. And here he has a famous disagreement with the Rambam. He says, first of all, this author, meaning the Rambam, did not conduct himself wisely. To, he says, to ask a question that you're not going to answer is unwise. If you can't answer the question, don't, don't start. All you're going to do is give people doubts. You're going to raise a, a, a monumental, fundamental religious question, and you're going to say you can't answer it. You're going to leave people with doubts, with religious doubts, and you haven't done anyone a service that way. If you cannot not answer a question, don't raise the question. Uh, that's a, by the way, all lawyers know that. Right? Lawyers are trained. You never ask a question in court that you don't know the answer. Don't, uh, in cross-examining someone in the courtroom, you never ask a question that and so you're confident you know what the answer is going to be. The last thing you want is some unexpected answer in the court. You don't do that. And that's what he says. If you don't know, what, if you don't know the answer, you shouldn't have started in the first place. That's even worse. Don't do it. And he says, but now that you've raised the question, I'll give you a partial answer. I wouldn't have liked to speak about this, and I'm only forced to do it because you spoke about it. And your answer is no answer at all. So I'll give you a partial. Now notice he says a partial answer. Those are his own words. Which means what I'm going to tell you is not the truth. It's only part of the truth. 
It's just something I'm giving you that you might find useful because the question has been raised in the first place. And he says this. He says that God's knowledge, Hashem's knowledge, this sounds amazing, but this is what he says, is like astrological knowledge. Hashem knows the future like an astrologer knows the future. How does an astrologer know the future? He sees signs. He sees certain energies coming down from the stars. He sees a process in progress, and he can read it. Meaning, says the Ravid, that Hashem knows the future from outside. He stands outside it, and he sees it. When you stand outside something and watch it, you aren't causing it to happen. In other words, he could watch it from the outside, he could know what's happening, he could know what's going to happen, but the very fact that you watch something and know it perfectly does not cause it to happen. I'll give you an example. Let's say you watch a child, a little kid, a little baby, a toddler, crawling across the floor towards a glowing fire. And you know this child is attracted by the glowing coals, and you know for sure the child's going to reach out and touch a glowing coal. Okay? And there's no question about it in your mind, and you watch the child do it and it happens. You for sure knew in advance what was going to happen. You didn't cause it. Knowing the future, right, does not mean you caused it to happen. It was still open. You're just clever enough to know. Now, I, my personal example that I tell myself in this context is I used to live in an apartment in South Africa in a place called Yeovil where I was on the second floor of a building and I lived on an intersection between two streets. One was very narrow. And there were times when I could see a car. I could look down from my balcony onto the street and I could see a car moving, edging out from the narrow road into the main road. And I could see cars coming down at a certain speed in the main road. And there was a certain point in time where an accident was inevitable. I could see that. The speed that he was going at and the speed that he was going at, about four to five seconds before the accident, there was a point of no return. And no matter what they would have done at that point, (coughs) there's no way they could have stopped it. And I used to go, ah, so I saw those things happening five seconds before they happened. I assure you I never caused them. I mean, I hope you, I hope you believe me. Right? I, I have special powers. It's well known that I have special powers, but... Hold on one second. And therefore, the rabbit says, because you see something with certainty in advance, like an astrologer who can see what's going to happen because he's got the wisdom to see it, God certainly has the wisdom, and therefore you could know in advance. Knowing a thing in advance does not mean you're the cause. That's what he says. He says it's only a partial answer. And the Rambam's obvious attack on this would be that God is not like an astrologer. He doesn't know a thing from the outside. He is the thing that happens. You're not watching it from the outside. Just like he and his knowledge are not two, he and the world are not two. The, the, the world, the fabric of reality is him. And therefore you can't say he stands outside of things. What happened to Hashem like and Hashem Echad? God is one. He's not standing at a distance like an astrologer <coughs> watching something in the distance. It's a completely wrong conception. That's what, the would, that's what the Raman would say, but that is what the Raman would say. Let's go through a few more approaches here, and you'll see there are some absolutely incredible ones. Maybe the two most striking, right? And I'm warning you, this is very difficult and dangerous. What I'm going to tell you now, share with you now, is dangerous, so much so that many later commentaries have said we shouldn't be speaking about this, because too dangerous. But since they do speak about it, let's speak about it. But I'm warning you, caution is in place here. The two most extreme approaches are the Raoul Bug, who's sometimes known as Gersonides, one of the great Spanish authorities and of the, of the 10th to 15th centuries, and the Rabena Crescas, who lived in the 1400s. Rabena Crescas was a great Spanish authority. He lived in the time of the Inquisition. The Spanish killed his son. Um, and he wrote a work to, Ram- to, to, to rival the Rambam, incredible work called Or Hashem, uh, and other, other works as well. Let me tell you what these two great authorities say. They're as extreme as you can imagine, and both dangerous and problematic. <coughs> the Raul Bug says, now you hold on to your seat for this, we're talking about a very religious man, the Raul Bug, one of the greatest rabbis of all time. He says the resolution of this problem is that God does not know the future. He may be God, but he doesn't know the future. Now, how can he say a thing like that? First of all, he has plenty of proofs. You know, the great rabbis, they don't say things just plucked from the air. He has proofs. And there are a long list of verses in the Torah that make it quite apparent that God does not know the future. And once you become alerted to this, you see it everywhere. I'll give you one or two examples. He says this, that when Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son, Hashem asks Avram to sacrifice his son, and he goes through the motions of this test, and finally Hashem has to stop him. At the end of the test, Hashem says, listen to these words, Atayadati, now I know that you are a God-fearing person. Hashem says to Abraham, Now I know that you are a God-fearing person. 
Now I know. Which means, until now, I did not know. The only way you can say, now I know, is if you mean, until this moment, I didn't know. Another example. When Sodom is behaving very wickedly, Hashem says, let us go down and see their wickedness. Ne'er daven, let us go down and see. Ere, let me go down and see. Let me go down and see. Go down to see. If I don't go down, I don't see. Meaning, I don't know unless I make a special effort of going to look. There are plenty of verses in the Torah in which you see, apparently, that Hashem's knowledge is, um, is withheld. You also see clearly in the Torah that He does know the future. Because there are plenty of times when He announces that certain people will sin. He tells Moshe that Pharaoh will sin. He tells Moshe Rabbeinu that the Jewish people will rise and sin after he dies. And so forth and so on. There are plenty of examples like that too. But there's no question there are examples where Hashem appears not to know. That's what the Ralbach says. And because he says this, he was extremely severely criticized. The authorities of his day and later who castigate him severely, they never attack him on a personal basis saying that he was not, not valid in any way. Although the Rivosh does say in one place that his mind was distorted by philosophy. He says his mind was distorted by Greek philosophy. He had too much contact with Greek philosophy and it distorted his thinking. But even then he regards him as a great person, clearly. So obviously we're not talking about somebody who's beyond the pale. What does he mean? Let's just spend a few moments trying to explain. And again, we'll need Kabbalah here to give a feel for this. But just while we're on, while we're on the subject, Rabbi, let me just say a word about this. This is difficult, but it's important to know. How can you say Hashem does not know? How can you say He doesn't know something, doesn't know the future? The answer is this. And again, dangerous stuff. How can you say that Hashem has any limitation? Limitation to His knowledge is one form of limitation. But surely you cannot say that Hashem is limited in any way. And the truth is we do. We do say He's limited. There are plenty of limitations that we place on Hashem. For example, we give Him parts. We say the Torah says He has a hand, He has an eye, a mighty hand, an outstretched arm. The Torah talks about parts. Parts are limitations, right? If you have finite parts, you have a hand, you have a foot, you're talking about something that has something in common with a human. You say weak, yeah. I thought the Torah was God. The Torah, yes, good, good, good. Even worse. The Torah says, just one, one, one second, hold on one second. I have enough trouble with him, just one more. <laughs> the Torah says clearly, the Torah says, Hashem speaking. He speaks of himself as limited. And the Rambam says, it's forbidden to think about Hashem as having a hand or a foot or an eye. You're not allowed to do that. It's wrong and it's forbidden. But the Torah does. What's going on? So here's, and there are many ways you could put the question, but let me tell you the answer. The answer is that in the depth of Kabbalistic teaching, the deepest of all Kabbalistic ideas, I'm only going to say the word once, because we shouldn't be talking about this, is a thing called the Tzimtzum. What does that mean? It means that when Hashem began to create the world, He contracted Himself, retracted Himself away from the zone of reality where we operate. He took Himself out. He limited Himself. Right? He shrank himself away. The description in, in, in Kabbalah, and here's where the Arizal, in fact, the very first page, you can look it up, you don't need me for this, look it up on the very first page of the famous Eitz Chaim. There the Arizal, by the way, not only does he say this, he actually has a picture. He actually has a picture of what was before creation. The picture is a circle with a dot in the middle. By the way, the famous Kabbalistic debate, is there really a dot in the circle? Or was it just in the ancient books when they made a circle? <laughs> this is how they did it, so the printers had like a dot in the middle of the circle. But uh, be that as it may, he says that before the creation began, there was a thing called Ensof. Ensof means the endlessness of Hashem. It's not a name. It's just a description of what was before creation began. Ein Sof. It had no end. And the Ramchal says very clearly, you may say nothing about this. Don't ask questions. You're not even allowed to ask questions about this. This is something before the creation began that you cannot wrap your mind around. All you could ever think about it would be wrong. And therefore it's completely forbidden to think about this stage before creation, which is called Ensof. The Leshem says in one place, you can say only something negative about it. Aim, so it has no end. But you cannot say what it does have. Because if you said anything about it in the positive, you'd be limiting it. Anything. So you can say there's no limitation. That you can say, because you're not saying anything about it. You're just saying it doesn't have any limits. That you can say. So you can say it's called Ein Sof. By the way, I'll just tell you a famous, a famous, you know, the Gemara in Chagiga says you're not allowed to think about this. 
The way the Gemara puts it there is it says, you may not think of what's in front, what's behind, what's above, and what's below. You may not think about what's in front, what's behind, what's above, and what's below. In other words, outside the zone of creation. You may not think about it. So there's a famous incident in the life of the Gaon of Vilna. He was once speaking to his student, Reb Chaim Velozhin. And the Gaon mentioned, the Gaon of Vilna, he's talking about one of the most amazing, stupendous minds of the last thousand years. The Gaon of Vilna mentioned his Yetzirah, his evil inclination. He's talking about an unbelievably, indescribably righteous genius. And he spoke about his temptation to sin. So when his student heard that, he said, he, he couldn't control himself. He said, Rebbe, I wish my Yetzer Tov was like your Yetzer I, I, I wish my, the holiest aspect of me was as, was as, as good as your, your temptation to sin. So the God said to him, don't say that. You have no idea how bad my temptation is. You have no idea how bad it is. It's terrible, my temptation to sin. You know what my temptation is? To think what's in front, what's behind, what's above, and what's below. That's what tempts me. That's what he said. Now, when you hear that story, People think to themselves, I mean, what's the right response? Imagine you were the student of the God <coughs> and your Rebbe said, Whoa, I have a terrible Yetzer. And you say, Rebbe, you know, that's, I, I wish I was as good as your worst. And he says, no, mine's terrible. And what is it? I wish to think about Hashem so powerfully about God. I, I, I long to think about the forbidden levels and, and knowing more. I would say, wow, give me that again and again. I, I, no. <laughs> But what the Gon was saying was, you have no idea how bad this is, because that's called idolatry. And it doesn't get worse than that. To think about Hashem, where you're not allowed to think, and give a form of thought, you're limiting Him to the finite. And that's exactly what idolatry is. This is the worst of all temptations. Everything else pales in insignificance. You want to think about God, and you want to give Him thoughts, you want to conceptualize Him and have an image and a picture. The technical word for that in Hebrew is Hagshama. To make a guess and to make something material, even if it's only a thought, that you may not do. So you're not allowed to think about that. But in that endlessness, a sphere opened. And that's called what I said, right? That's the open sphere. And in that sphere is a zone, not of endlessness, but of end. Before was all borderless and endlessness. And in that zone, the endlessness went away. And in that zone, it became possible to create a world that has ends, borders, distinctions. Right? And into that zone of darkness, if you want to describe it in a metaphor, you say that before was an endless white light. An endless white light. Right? We're not talking about light here. We're talking about something way before light. But you can use a picture, you can say endless white light. In the middle of that, in the dead center, in the exact center of the infinite white light, and of course the you say, how can you have yeah. an exact center of infinity? <laughs> but, uh, but, but that's what it says. And there's a meaning to it. A sphere of darkness, the light was eliminated, retracted, and darkness opened up. And that's where we are. We exist in the zone of darkness. And the famous argument, I'm not going to go into this now, the most famous of all arguments probably in the depth of Judaism is, is this just a way of saying something, or is it real? Is when Hashem took himself out of that zone, so to speak, is that just an illusory way of saying something for us, or did he really take himself out? And I, I presume you're aware that this was the center of the argument between the early Hasidim and the early Misnagdim. You know, in the war between, in the 1700s, when the Hasidic idea began to take root, this was the fundamental argument. And the fundamental argument was, the Hasidim said, this is just a way of speaking. This is just a way of speaking. God is everything. He never took himself out of anything. Ain't no vado. There's nothing besides Hashem. This is just a way of speaking. And Misnagdim said, if it says it, it means it. It's real. And the argument was extreme. The, 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 the Hasidim said to Misnagdim, they said to them, according to you, they, they said to the Hasidim, according to you, if Hashem never took himself out and is all that there is, how come you cannot learn Torah or say Shema in places that are unclean? According to you, there's nothing unclean, it's all God. They said, well, we can't understand that, but that's what it says. And then they turned to them and they said, according to you, how can you say that Hashem is taking himself away? He's everything that there is. What do you mean? How could he? They said, well, we don't understand, but that's what it says. Rav Dessler said he once spent 36 hours in a row trying to figure out which side of the debate, like, you know, you could, and he couldn't understand either one, so he didn't think about it anymore. But that was the argument. Are we talking about an illusion where all is Hashem and there's some way of speaking here? Or are we saying that he really took himself away and left a zone of darkness where he's not? Either of them is very proper. By the way, this was not an academic argument. You know what the next step of the argument was. 
if you hold the Hasidic point of view and you say it's all illusory, it's all God, then who knows what you'll end up doing. You can end up davening Shachris at four in the afternoon and Mincha at two o'clock in the morning because time ain't real either. And things were spinning out of control like that. And that's why the other side, the Gona Vilna, was frantic, right, about this issue because if you start saying it's all Hashem, who knows where you'll end up in your... No. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you believe that Hashem has taken himself out, and you lose sight of animal body, you lose sight of the fact that everything is Hashem, what happens to your spiritual your depth? Right? You, you, you've done something equally problematic, equally bad. And of course, if that will happen, uh, you'll lose all attachment to the spiritual world. And of course, both the tension between the two of them brought them into balance, so that Judaism was incredibly enriched by that process. And today, of course, the result of the tension and the war, and it became a war. I mean, there was violence between the sides. The tension between them pulled both into balance. The non-Hasidic side benefited enormously from the Hasidic idea, the rhapsodic and the elevated and the, the connection with the Kabbalistic. And of course, the Hasidic world was held within the bounds of halachic, halachic practice. So that is the, that's the result. But that, that was the practical fear <coughs> that might come out of this. Anyway, that was, the, and in that dark space, the world was created. So note what's happening. Before creation began, God limited himself. Took himself out. Maybe. Well, okay, let's say it again. According to, <laughs> the, the form of the words is that he took himself out. What that means, we're debatable. So he began with a limitation. If he hadn't limited himself, you could not be here. Because you're a finite, limited creature. You're a, certainly a finite being. And therefore, there must be a limitation of infinity. And so creation begins with a finite limitation. And therefore, the old bug is not saying anything as radical as it sounds like he's saying. Hashem has limited himself. And the most important limitation is he's taking himself out of a manifest knowledge so you can have free will. Right? And there are plenty of statements like that. There's one place that says, Lilibi, it says, Ani yeshena libi er. I am asleep, but my heart is awake. And on that, the Gemara says, Lilibi gilisi le evarai lo gilisi. I've revealed this to my heart. God says, I've revealed this to my heart, referring to the messianic date, but I've not revealed it to my limbs. Hashem says, I have revealed this to my heart, but I've not revealed this wisdom to my limbs, to my own limbs, whatever limbs mean. So there are clear statements of this, of this idea of limitation. Let me just give you one more, perhaps to make it a bit easier to understand. The Nefesh Chaim speaks about this very clearly, and this we certainly can speak about. He says that, how can you, how can you begin to talk about Hashem's limitation and having a hand and an eye and a foot and all that. And he gives the most extreme example. And if this doesn't, you know, if this doesn't distress you, then, you know, nothing will. It says in Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, which is a love song between Hashem and us, it says, Yonati Tamati. Hashem describes us as Yonati Tamati, my dove, my pure one. Hashem, like a husband calling his speaking to his wife. God speaks to Jewish people, Yonati Tamati, my dove, my pure one. The Medrash says, do not read Tamati, my pure one, read Toomati, my twin. My twin. Hashem calls us his twin. On that, the Medrash says, he's called our twin because he's no older than we are. We, the Jewish people, know our God personally because we grew up together. What's being said? Us and God, we grew up together. He's not older than we are. We were buddies in kindergarten and we grew up together. What is going on? Says Nefer Shechaim, we are talking about the name of Hashem. That's why in English you don't have this. In English you say God, it means nothing. In Hebrew you say Hashem, the name. The, what Hashem is, what God is, before the name we may not think about. The one whose name it is you cannot think about. But you can think about the name. The name is something that is set up and created, that contains His oneness and His infinity, but it's a name and it relates to you. The secret of a name is always for the one outside the name. Your name is not for you. Your name is for me. Your name is for me. The last thing you need is a name. If you lived isolated on a desert island, the last thing you would be able to use would be a name. Your name is for someone outside of you. Hashem's name is for us. And therefore there was no need for a name before creation began. He's not older than we are. We're not talking about what he is. That's off limits. You can't say anything about that. But the name was created only for people who needed to use a name. Is, is that, is that, when you meet someone, you say, Hi, my name is? In South Africa, we used to say, Aunt Hanama Kenneth, my name is Dennis. Yeah, okay, so be that. But everybody's name was Dennis. But the point is that 
I'm pleased to meet you. This is my name. Your name is for some, and therefore Hashem, God did not use or need a name before creation began because there was no one to call the name. And all aspects of Hashem's limitation only apply to, to his name. Believe me, that's hard enough to understand. One second. That's hard enough to understand, believe me, because he's in his name and he's one with his name, but that's what it is. And the name, after all, has four letters. It's Yud, and a He, and a Vav, and a He. It is something specific. It has a specific and finite manifestation, which is where you can grasp it. And therefore, when the Ral Bug says that Hashem withholds something, so to speak, it's in this manifestation of a name. The one whose name it is, is totally off limits. You're not allowed to think about it. When you make brachas, you're not allowed to think about that. When you do mitzvahs, you're not allowed to think about that. The one whose name it is, is off limits. If you want an analogy, it's like a human being. You never see the person. You only see the manifestation. You see the body, you hear the sounds, you hear the voice. You only see the externalities. Of course, you're doing that relationship to know the inner being. But you never see it, it never manifests on the outside. And sim- similarly, Hashem fills the world. You never see him, you only see his outer manifestation. Anyway, that's Ramba. Let's move on to Rabbi Christmas. Is, it, is this too much? Is it, a little more energy? A bit more? So what do we say? Either Hashem doesn't know the future, or you have no free will. Ramba says Hashem doesn't know the future. He hides his knowledge. He steps back and functions as if he doesn't know, so that you can have free will. Right? Like Hashem arrives in the garden, and he says to man, Where are you? I don't see you. Ayaka, where are you? And man crawls out from under the trees. And Hashem says to him, Did you eat the fruit of the tree? I don't know. Haminaites, did you eat the fruit of the tree? Time and again, Hashem expresses himself in his relationship with us as not knowing. That's Rabbi. Rabbi Nekreskas takes the extreme opposite view. He says, basically, You don't have free will. God knows the future. That means you have no free will. Now, that's how he's presented. Okay? Let me, let me make it plain that if you study his words inside, the superficial presentations are always that Ral Bug says that God doesn't know, and they just leave it there, and Rabbi Kreska says you have no free will, and they leave it there. It's completely untrue. Obviously, he believes in free will. But he does take an extreme view. And without going to the details, I'll just summarize one aspect of what he says. <coughs> Anyone wants references, you can ask me or email me. I'll be happy to give you the text. He says this, that your free will is extremely limited. Extremely limited. In some cases, he says clearly you have no free will at all. The classic example he gives is with regard to faith. He says when it comes to Emunah, you have no free will. He's talking about the generation that left Egypt and saw miracles. He says if you had experiences like that, you would have no free will at all. If you witnessed miracles and you stood at Sinai and God appeared, knowledge doesn't get better than that. And if you see that, you have no choice about faith. He goes further. He says that even in our generation, he says something like this. You cannot have choice when it comes to matters of faith. You can't choose to believe. Think about it for a moment. You examine evidence. If the evidence suggests to you a certain outcome, you accept it. If the evidence doesn't add up, you don't. You can't choose to believe something that you don't believe. is ridiculous. <coughs> is this clear? Imagine somebody shows you certain evidence, and you think it's faked and forged and not good enough evidence. Now you tell yourself, you choose, I'm going to believe it anyway. It's ridiculous. How can you ever bend your mind into a pretzel? You can't do that. You either accept evidence, and that's called believing the thing, or you don't. You can't, is this clear? You can't will yourself not to believe something you believe, and you can't will yourself to believe something you don't believe. And therefore he says, so why does God command you in this area? And where's reward and punishment? And he says something amazing. He says clearly, time and again, when it comes to matters of belief, you're not rewarded for your belief, and you're not punished for disbelief. You're rewarded for your attitude. That means when you know what it means to be Jewish, and you know what it means to be part of this incredible historical process, and you understand what Hashem is based on the evidence, and and you understand that, and the evidence is strong enough that you accept it, the question is, how do you feel about it? Do you enjoy that? Do you relish it? Do you identify with it and accept it? Or do you feel resentful and wish it hadn't been that way and repudiate it and step out of it? And that's what your reward and punishment is. It's your relationship with that. The joy you feel... For example, for example, let's say you do a mitzvah. Let's say you do an action in the world. I'll give you an example. Let's say you do an action in the world that's bad. A bad action. And let's say you had no choice. For example, the addiction. You were so seriously addicted that you had no choice. Let's not ask how you got into this addiction. But you're addicted to a certain thing. He goes so far as to say it's quite clear that there are human actions that are beyond choice. And this person cannot be blamed for something that he's addicted to. What's he blamed for? How do you feel about what you did? 
when you did a bad action because you were addicted to it, do you hate yourself for it and wish you hadn't done that and make every effort to change? Or do you relish it and say, identify with your sin? That you're guilty for. In other words, your inner attitude, he goes, he also says a very beautiful thing. He says, the mitzvah of Simchas Yonta, this is unbelievable. What is the mitzvah of rejoicing on a festival? He says, the real source of rejoicing on a festival, this is an amazing idea, is simply understanding what it means to be Jewish. What is a festival? A festival is a way station on the journey of history. Going out of Egypt, becoming the Jewish people, receiving the Torah. When you go through the year and you celebrate those days, you have no choice about accepting or not accepting. If you understand history, you'll know that it's true. The question is, do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy what it means? Do you feel the unbelievable privilege of being part of this historical process that brought this incredible spiritual knowledge to the world that is the Torah, that's marching towards the world's final... He says, if you understand that, every time you get to a way station on that journey and you understand what it is, you'll be drunk, delirious with delight. And that's the mitzvah. The mitzvah of, of, of Yom Tov is simply... Every festival is a way station on the journey. And as you get there, <coughs> by the way, it's not Shabbat. Shabbos, there's no mitzvah of Simcha. Shabbos, the mitzvah is rest and pleasure. Oneg is pleasure and rest. Because Shabbos is celebrating the destination. But Chag, a festival, is celebrating way stations on the journey. And the meaning of the journey is the ecstasy of being part of this journey. One of the great rabbis of this generation, of Moshe Shapiro, he said, if you understood what it meant to be Jewish, you'd put your hat like this at an angle, and you'd dance down the street like a drunk Cossack. That's what he said. You'd drunk like a, if you understood what it meant, just the privilege of being part of this process. Anyway, that is, Sarabana Kreskas, in summary, says that you have very little free will. Many actions are beyond your will. Why are you culpable? Because even when you're forced into an action, do you accept it and identify with it and rejoice in it? express your personality that way or do you or do you reject it further than that you should know even in addictive situations where you have no choice you made a choice somewhere in the past somewhere there was a point of choice and you had an option and you slipped into it and then you went down a pathway and maybe 20 years later when you're smoking 50 a day maybe you have no choice therefore you're not culpable for this but you're culpable for the point of origin it may be a year ago, it may be 10 years ago, it may be when you were 13 or when you were 21, you did something, and even if you lucked into a situation that you genuinely can claim, that you cannot climb out of, you're exempt. But you're not exempt for the mistake you made, or the credit that you took, that you pushed down this pathway. And by the way, a lot of religious activities like that. A lot of good spiritual religious activities because people got into the habit. And they cannot really claim that they really made a free choice to do this mitzvah every day because they're in the habit pattern of doing it. And therefore, you're getting no reward. What you're getting reward for is the original choice, a Baal Shiva. person that grew up, didn't grow up religious, he grew up normal. And, uh, you know, he decided to become more religious. And he starts eating kosher food. 25 years down the line, he's got no choice to eat unkosher food. He wouldn't think about it. He'd be sick at the thought. He offered him a pork burger, whatever they eat. Shrimp laced uh, cheese burger. <laughs> He'd be sick at the thought. He couldn't possibly eat it. If he tried, he couldn't eat it. And therefore, there's no reward when he resists that temptation. But his reward every day for the choice that got him into this pathway, right? and of course we struggle to put consciousness into it. Every time you do a mitzvah, there's a big danger that you do that a habit, that you do this good deed, and it can be in very personal matters, not only when you eat matzah on Pesach, it can also be, be when you say kind words to your wife, or you do something in the intimacy of a, of a, of a marital or friendship relationship. Right? Are you really doing this as an act of love, or are you doing it because like this is the habit, and you're not really thinking about it? Right? It's just a tired pattern that you've gotten into, that's an insult an insult to the relationship. Obviously, we try desperately to put freshness and newness into it. That's a danger on the good side and the bad side. So that is Rabbani Kreskas. Can, uh, can, can you hold the questions just for a minute? There's endless m more discussion here, but I'll just perhaps share with you one more, if I may. Those are perhaps some of the most famous points in the discussion. But let me just add one more, although there are many more. But I'll just add one more. The Shloh says, the Shloh says, the great, again, Kabbalistic master, he says something very interesting. By the way, I promised to mention the Arizal. The Arizal says, the way that he gives us, the language he gives us to talk about this problem is, he says that in a famous in a book that he, that he uh, attributed, a book of his teaching called Arba Meos Shekel Kesef, at the very last page, someone asked him a question about this and he answers like this. He says that both are true. Hashem knows in advance, and you have free will. But they occupy two different spiritual places. Hashem's knowledge, 
is true in the spiritual world, and your free will is true in your world. And if you elevated yourself into Hashem's world, you would have no free will at all. In fact, you would disappear. If you crossed the boundary, when, our Moshe, when Hashem told Moshe that he could only see the 49th gate of wisdom, he could not see the 50th gate. The reason is because Hashem, not because Hashem didn't want him to know, but because if you raise yourself to the 50th gate, which is knowing Hashem himself, you disappear. Because at that level, Hashem will kill Hashem Echad, there's only Hashem. And therefore, in Hashem's world, in God's world, the world of His knowledge, not only don't you have free will, you don't exist. There is no free will at all. And in your world, where you exist, He gives you free will. Can you hear this is really another way of saying there's a limitation in those worlds. He gives a very beautiful example. He t- says a lot, but he gives one beautiful example. He says this, the Talmud says when a child is born, he's forced to make an oath. The Talmud says, as a baby is born, God makes the child make an oath. The oath the child makes is to hate tzaddik va'alti rosha. Be righteous and do not be evil. And every baby who's born, every human, this is not Jews, every human being who's born is forced at the point of birth to take an oath that he will be righteous and not be wicked. The Arizal says, how could God make a child swear, knowing that it's going to be a false oath? Here's this little baby born. He's going to be a massive criminal. And as he's born, God, seeing the future, knowing he's going to be a criminal, says, swear you'll be righteous. He's forcing the child to make a false oath. How cruel can you be? Bad enough, he's going to be a criminal. Now he forces him to make an oath that he's going to break. See the problem. Says that result. When the child is born, God operates with the child in the world of the child's knowledge. Not in the world of God's knowledge. He operates in the world of the child's knowledge, which does not know the future. And in that interaction with the child, he says, Let, we're not looking at the future. You, be righteous. And the child swears he's going to be righteous. But Hashem is operating in the world of the child's knowledge, the world of limitation. And he very clearly talks about these two places and many others. Rav Tzadok Akon, for example, speaks out in great detail. Ishbitz is famous for this. There are two places, again, not to take it over simplistically, but there are two so-called places. The place of Hashem's knowledge, in which there's no free will at all. He says incredible things. He says that at that level, Yaakov and Esau are equal. They're the same. There's no difference between them. And many, many mysterious things like that. Let me just make reference to the Shlok because it's fascinating and I'll finish with that. The Shlok says, first of all, he has a long introduction with, I speak with great trepidation, he says, and who knows if I'm, what I'm saying is right. And I, and I, but since other great people have spoken about it, obviously there's permission to speak. Yeah, it's a whole introduction. If you look it up, it's amazing. And he says the following thing. And it's very hard, I'm warning you. He says, what God knows, what Hashem knows, is all the possibilities of the future. He knows all the possibilities. He knows all the multiplex pathways that history could take. But which one it's going to take, He knows only in a certain way when you do it. In other words, He sees you at a certain point in time, and He sees all the pathways (coughs) of the future, the ones that will happen, and the ones that won't happen. But all the ones that are possible. He quotes a Kabbalistic work called the Pardes, work of the Ramak, and he puts it in very Kabbalistic terms. He says, Hashem's Yediyah is in Tiferes. It's a Kabbalistic term, but it only happens in Malchus when you do it. In Kabbalah, there's a thing called Tiferet, which is in the higher part of the world. It sits in this position, and Malchus is outside the body, and what happens is that Hashem knows it at this higher level of spiritual reality, and when you do it, you make it real at the lower place, and then that operates back on the higher place. That's what he says. He gives examples. Let me try to just give it a bit of a feel. He comments on the verse that says that you're obliged to build a fence around your roof. Right? This is the source of many safety. In England, you call this health and safety. Okay? Where did they get the idea of health and safety? From the Bible. Because the Bible says if you build a roof, you've got to put a fence around your roof. The Bible doesn't freak out phonetically like they do over here. <laughs> but, you know, it says make a thing around your roof. Okay. So, you are... Um, now, listen to this. The Torah says like this. Build a fence around your roof, a ma'ake, shema yipol hanofel, lest the one who falls will fall. Shema yipol hanofel, lest the one who will fall, falls. Says the Gemara on that. Build a parapet around your roof, in case the one who is destined to fall from the six days of creation falls. Don't let him fall. Put a fence around your roof. Just one second. If he's destined from the six days of creation, what's your fence going to help? You hear the problem. You see that you see you see the shimmering problem in the background. Put a fence around your roof so that the one who's destined to fall, that God knew when he created it was going to fall, put a fence so he doesn't fall. What's going on? The Talmud used a very interesting expression. The Talmud used the expression Harraui Lipol. 
Very beautiful. Ra'ui lipo means the one who is fitting tends to fall, may well fall. Says the shlow, what it means is there was a strong possibility that this person would fall. Don't you be the one to let him fall. You put the fence up. Whether it means he'll fall from someone else's roof or whether it means he won't fall, that's, that's open. But you put the fence up. Meaning that there was a possibility and it was seen and yet you have to act anyway, right? Let me give you, I guess you have two examples to, to make it plain. And these are really amazing. If this doesn't move you, there's no hope for you. There's a class of events in Torah that fit into this day. And I'll give you, I'll give you one classic example. Another few minutes. It's worth, it's worth the effort. You know when Ishmael was dying. Ishmael was evicted from Aram's house and he's dying of thirst in the desert and his mother's sitting at a distance. She doesn't want to see her son die. Hagar. And as Ishmael's about to die, Hashem proposes creating a well or opening her eyes miraculously so she sees a well. She'll have water. She'll save her son's life. As Hashem's about to do that, the angels object. The angels object. The angels say, God, Hashem, how can you save this child's life? This is Ishmael. He's going to grow up to be the Arab peoples who will torture your people. And they refer to a particular event. When the Babylonians exiled the Jews, the Jews were left out, led out of Israel. And as they were exiled, they passed Arab lands. And the Arabs came out to them with bags of what looked like was water. But they were really filled with compressed air. And the thirsty Jews that they gave to drink the water, the air would explosively kill them. Right? They're a very cruel way of treacherously killing Jews. So the angel said, this little boy Yishmael is going to grow up to be that nation that will torture and kill your people with water. And you want to save his life with water? He doesn't deserve it. <coughs> so Hashem said to the angels, what is he now? Is he evil or righteous at this moment? So the angel said, right now he's, a, he's, a, he's an innocent child. But Hashem Husham, this is all verse based on the words in the Torah, but Hashem Husham, I judge him as he is there. So God said, if he's righteous now, I save him. I don't relate to the future. Now listen carefully to the problem. Listen carefully. This is amazing. To understand this will change your life. The angels see that God is going to create a well to save Yishmael, <coughs> right? Which will lead him to survive so that he becomes a nation of people who harm the Jews in the future. So what do they do? They say, Hashem, don't do that. Let him die now. But how can he die now? You've already seen a future in which he doesn't die. You've seen the future, right? You're angels. You see reality. You see more clearly than the prophets. You see that in so many centuries' time, this child who survived and had children is going to be such a nation. Now you apply to have, to have him die now, so it doesn't happen. How could it not happen? You've seen it already! Do you see the problem? How can you apply? Uh, this is like time machines where you go back in time and kill your great grandfather. I mean, if you, you know. Yeah, like, uh, um, you see the problem. Says the Shlom, what's happening here is. They're not seeing the future. They're seeing the possibilities of the future. They're seeing one of the possibilities. You could put it like this. They see in this little child now the seed of such a future. They see in him now the incipient, dormant seed of a cruelty that could lead itself in the future. To, and that's what they're applying. They're not applying to have a future that happened, so to speak, killed. They're applying to have one of the possibilities of the future closed. What they see is not the future. What they see is all the possibilities of the future. That's what he says. I'll give you one more famous example. One more famous example is that when Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu went out of the palace, he saw an Egyptian beating a Jew. And he was going to kill him. Using his spiritual power, he's going to kill him. So it says, before he killed him, he looked this way and that. He looked this way and that way. Now, the simple meaning is, he wanted to see. No one was watching who would report him to the Egyptian police and get, him, and get himself killed. But the Kabbalistic interpretation is, he looked into this Egyptian and he looked into his future and he saw no righteous descendant coming out of this man. And when he saw that this Egyptian was not destined to have anyone righteous come out of him, he killed him. Why? Because had he seen a righteous descendant, he would have killed him. Because although he might deserve to die, but, it, but that descendant that's going to be righteous and the the Talmud in Perikhelik has an example of a number of the most wicked people who had righteous descendant, descendants, and they got married because they're righteous descendants. And therefore, he would have let him live. Had he seen a righteous descendant, is this clear? But think about the problem. He looks into the future and sees no righteous descendants, so he kills him. Of course there's going to be no righteous descendants. You just killed him. You're about to kill him. 
Talk about a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's impossible. He looks into the future. Is anyone righteous going to come out of him? Ah, uh, no. Great, kill him. Uh, well, uh, well, of course no one's righteous going to come out of him. Better kill him. <laughs> oh, what's the meaning of this? Shlo's explanation. He looks into this Egyptian now and sees in him no seed of goodness. There's no possibility now in him that could lead to one of those possibilities in the future. And therefore he kills him. Again, you have to explain, not that he's seeing the future prophetically. You can't change that once you've seen it. But what he sees is the evolving possibilities. This is a, a fascinating take on this. By the way, the Shlach says something incredible. He says that Hashem sees now what the past was going to be at the same time. And he's, he's the most beautiful proof of this. Let's go back to the verse that I told you to remember. Hashem says to Avram, kill your son. And then he says, don't do it. And after the test, he says to him, now I know you are, listen to this, now I know you are a righteous person. Ata yadati. Now I know you are righteous. Listen to the words in Hebrew. Ata yadati. Now I knew. The grammar does not say now I know. That's how they translate in the King James Bible. Now I know you are a righteous person. But look at the words. Ata yadati. Now I reveal to you that I always knew. That's what it is, right? You see clearly, beautifully in the words. Anyway, these are some of the approaches. Of course, there are many more. There are many more angles on this, of course. Fascinating angles. Can I keep you for one more minute? <laughs> Any, we can ask a question. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll stay for a question. But let, let, me just, let me just add one more. One of the most fascinating aspects of this question is whether you really need alternatives in the first place to have free will. To have a free choice, and Hashem knows beforehand that you're going to go left and not right. So right was never an option. Does that mean you don't have free choice? Okay. Let, me tell you, let me tell you how this works. There's a classic Torah source on this, Rabbi Khanan Basman. Rabbi Khanan Basman says that Hashem knows the outcome, but since you don't, you have free will. It's true that the outcome had to be this way, but you chose! The example is he gives that when Shimshon, Samson, chose a Philistine woman, which he should not have done, He's held accountable for it. It led to his destruction. The verse says that it was inevitable. The verse says his father and mother did not know that this was from Hashem. Meaning that the fact that he would take that woman and history would play itself out was predestined and known with no option otherwise. But he didn't know that and he made a choice. So Bukhanan shows us, by the way, he has a lachic application. His application is this. Imagine you walk up to a man who always eats cheeseburgers. And he's about to order his cheeseburger. You pull out your 45, 45 caliber Smith & Wesson, which you carry in your purse, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's okay for a lady to carry that around. It's very good. Not to wear it. That's problematic. But to have about her. And you put this magnum to the guy's head and you say to him, eat a cheeseburger. And the fellow eats unkosher food at gunpoint. Says Rukhan Vassaman, he's 100% guilty. He's 100% guilty. He can't claim he was forced to do it. Why? Because he would have done it anyway. The gun's irrelevant. He says that if you force someone to do a sin that he was going to do anyway, he cannot again. If someone forces you to, to do a sin in Jewish law, you're not culpable. Someone forces you to sign a contract, the contract is not culpable. If someone forces you to do an action, you're not responsible. Says Rav Asman, if someone forces you to do an action that you would have done anyway, you are responsible. Because the gun was irrelevant. In other words, there was no choice otherwise. There was a gun there. Had you decided to do different, you couldn't have. But you're guilty anyway. In other words, you don't need... Is this clear? You don't need alternative possibilities. All you need is choice. You made the choice. You chose to do bad. Ah, had you not chosen it, he would have forced you. But he didn't, because he did choose. So you can demonstrate that alternative possibilities are not needed in the world. But there's one step further, and I'll finish with this. Think about it. The fellow had no possibility of choosing differently, correct? But he did make a choice. <coughs> what would happen if you were forced to choose? That means your mind was forced. Not gunpoint from the outside. This is proposed by an American philosopher in 1989, and it's called the theory of alternate possibilities. Very interesting, fascinating, modern philosophical debate about it. But I'll just tell you what he said, this philosopher. His name's Harry Frankfurt, a well-known modern American philosopher. He said this. He said, I will show you that even if you're not free to choose otherwise, 
you're still guilty. And you're still morally responsible. And here's the scenario. Listen carefully. He says, there's a fellow called Black who wants to kill Smith. Black wants to kill Smith. But he doesn't want to do it himself. He wants Jones to do it. Black wants Jones to kill Smith. So what does he do? He gets his friend who's a brain surgeon to operate on Jones at night when he's sleeping. He's a very good surgeon. He cuts open Jones's head and he puts in a little radio transmitter receiver, little receiver, little transponder in his brain that can make him decide whatever Black wants him to decide. And Black has a transmitter. And if Black presses a button on this transmitter, Jones wakes up, he's got no idea about the brain surgery. No idea. But in his brain is a little electronic device that is totally silent, dormant, off. But if Black presses the button, it will cause Jones to choose, to choose, not to do, to make a decision that Black wants him to do. And Black wants him to kill Smith. So what happens is, but he knows Jones is pretty likely to kill Smith anyway. So what does he do? He watches secretly from a distance and he sees Smith <laughs> walk up to Jones. I mean, walk up to Smith. And Jones has this 45 caliber magnet. And he waits for him to pull it out and pull the trigger. And he's got his hand hovering over the button. If Jones pulls the trigger, he will not touch his transmitter. The murder was done. He had nothing to do with it. That's exactly what he wants. If he sees, listen carefully, if he sees that Jones is about to decide not to, he presses the button, Jones decides to and he kills him. Did Jones have any possibility of choosing differently? No. Because had he not chosen what he did choose, he would have been forced to choose, not to act, to choose. There was no way that he could have chosen different. But in the end, he killed without the button being pressed. So Black never forced him to choose. Now think about it. Is Jones culpable or not? Is he guilty for murder? Why? Because he? And did he, did he use his free will to choose to kill him? Yeah. Absolutely. Could he have chosen differently? No. no. But he didn't know that. That's right. He couldn't have chosen differently. And since he made the choice to kill, he's morally accountable. With no alternative possibility. Not just of action. He couldn't even have chosen differently. Now that is Frankfurt's famous proposition. There have been dozens of attacks on it. Dozens of attacks. Philosophical, practical, brain device. How do you know what he's going to choose? That's right. That's right. You're on form tonight. That's quite right. That, just one second, one second. And therefore, he came up with this theory that you don't need alternative choices. Rabbi Wasserman is not saying that he's only seeing you don't need alternative outcomes. He does hold that you need in Judaism alternative choices. All this is moot, and I'll finish with this in the Rambam. Because the Rambam holds that you do have alternative choices. The Rambam holds you do have alternative choices. Absolutely. You really do have alternative choices. You can choose differently. And God knows that you won't. And that you cannot understand. Right? In other words, and the God of Yola puts it beautifully, he says, where philosophy ends, Kabbalah begins. That's why in analytical philosophy you cannot resolve this problem. Because we are not saying that you don't really have an ability to choose differently. The Rambam is saying that you could have chosen differently, and there could have been a different outcome in the world, and history would have not have been the way it's going to be. And you could have done that! But God knew that you wouldn't. <clears throat> but his knowledge did not force you, did not close that possibility. There are genuine open possibilities in the world, and he has proofs for that, and textual proofs, I'll just leave you with one textual proof. The Rambam says the Torah makes it plain that there are alternative possibilities in the world. Can you think of an example? Where does the Torah clearly make it, openly state that there are alternative possibilities? We have no, that, that, that's where the future is clearly stated. No, I'll tell you, he says like this. No, that's to prove you have choice. He gives us two examples. No, he says like this. Two examples. It says that One is a person falling from the roof, because the Torah says, Shema Yipol, maybe the one will fall, maybe this person will fall, meaning it's a possibility. And the second example, it says, the word, it says, when a man goes to war, and he's newly married, and he arrives at the battlefront, and he's in the first year of marriage, the Torah says, go home to your wife. Why? Shema Yamos Bomilchom, lest he die in war, and someone else take her. That means, go home, 
because you may die in war, and someone, it's a possibility. You may not, but you may, you may not die, but you may die. The Torah says you may. The Torah says it's a possibility. The Torah clearly speaks out alternate possibilities, scenarios that may or may not play themselves out, and the Torah is always telling truth. And therefore you see very clearly in Torah speaking out of alternative possibilities in the world as real, and you must make choices. So in summary, this evening what we began to study, just an introduction to the subject, is the question of free will and full knowledge, right? Our position is, it's axiomatic in Torah that God knows the future, and that does not take away your free will. What's the practical output of this? Despite knowing that Hashem knows what you're going to do, you need to make it happen. You know that He knows what you're going to do in the next moment. Don't use that as an excuse for getting out of responsibility, because it was destined anyway. You're accountable, and you have to take the steps, and you're going to be held accountable for good or for bad, even though you knew before it, right? The examples of that, I'm not going to go into them now. If you have any questions that I can answer, I'm very happy to try. Uh,